I kept the uh, the mummified uh, head and skull of one of the victims in uh, a, a carrying case in my locker at work. There was excitement, uh, fear, pleasure all mixed together. You think of the crimes that he committed, it's, they're so horrific, you kind of think only a madman or somebody totally evil. People that worked with him had no idea that he was a violent man. Never in a million years would I have guessed a homicidal maniac. To me, he's, he's always been really a tragic figure. Never, Jeffrey! Jeffrey, I hate you! I do! How could this little boy ever grow up to commit these humanly unimaginable and heinous crimes? Who were his parents? I know I did. How was he raised? What happened to the child? Ya, bagaimana bisa anak manis dari keluarga berada dan berpendidikan ini bisa tumbuh dewasa dan menjelma menjadi seorang monster gay yang paling menggemparkan di dunia? Dan ini bukanlah berita biasa, namun benar-benar kisah nyata yang akan kita kupas lebih dalam lagi dalam kemasan film dokumenter khas gay channel. Dari berbagai sumber terpercaya, selengkapnya sesaat lagi hanya di Youtube Gay Channel, membuka jendela dunia. What goes wrong from the time a child is born to the time they are savagely raping or molesting somebody else's child? That's what we're here to try and figure out today so that other parents can stop this from happening to your own children so that you might notice the signs and be able to do something before it's too late. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer atau lebih dikenal dengan nama Jeffrey Dahmer lahir pada 21 Mei 1960 di Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Amerika Serikat. Ia adalah putra pertama dari dua bersaudara. Jeffrey adalah anak pelisteran dari keluarga kaya dan berpendidikan. Sang ayah Lionel Herbert Dahmer adalah keturunan Jerman. Ia memiliki gelar PhD, seorang ilmuwan kimia. Dan sang ibu Joyce Dahmer adalah keturunan Norwegia dan Irlandia. Ia adalah seorang instruktur mesin teletype dengan bergelar master. Jeffrey kecil tumbuh seperti anak-anak pada umumnya. Ia anak yang energik. Ia senang bermain. Dan ayahnya, yang hobi memvideokan putranya ini, sering menemani Jeffrey bermain bersama dan mengajaknya ke taman bermain sambil merekam Jeffrey yang tengah bermain di berbagai kesempatan. Saat Jeffrey berusia sekitar 4 tahun, ia mulai menunjukkan minatnya pada hewan mati. Ketertarikannya itu dimulai ketika suatu hari keluarga ini kerja bakti untuk membersihkan bagian kolong rumahnya yang kotor dan terdapat beberapa bangkai hewan sejenis sigung yang sudah lama. Ayahnya mengeluarkan tulang-tulang hewan dari kolong rumah tersebut dan menarik perhatian Jeffrey karena tulang-tulang tersebut mengeluarkan suara dentingan yang diibaratkan seperti tongkat biola. Did you notice the signs, Mr. Dahmer? No, the only signs that I saw were shyness and reluctance to engage in social interactions, that sort of thing. But no, re really, no overt signs of any kind. Uh, when I look back on things like uh, the time I was at uh, Iowa State University in university housing, and uh, I went underneath the house to clear it out, Uh, of trash and debris. And he was I, four years old. At he the was time. about four years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because uh, you smell something under the house. Yeah, the civet cats. It's a member of the skunk family, and I wanted to go underneath and fix it up so they wouldn't get in again. Mm -hmm. and I found cans and bottles and uh, bones of mammals that the civet cats, uh, the skunks, had eaten. Mm -hmm. And so I cleared all of this debris up, including the bones, and put it into a. Uh, a metal pail mm -hmm. and Jeff was there and my former wife was there and it was just an ordinary operation at the time just a cleanup operation so you gone under the house and you found that these little skunk like creatures had eaten a lot of the rodents yeah, and left and, bones and left the bones mm -hmm. so you pull the bones out from under the house and your wife at the time and Jeffrey 
Dahmer, four years old. They're standing out, and and he started to go through the pale of bones. He was just four years old. Right. Correct? We were just discussing, my former wife and I, what, what I was doing, and I looked down, and I saw Jeff... Uh, uh, playing with the bones. Picking up the bones and dropping them back into the pail. And that was really the only time that I saw Did he seem fascinated? And, you know, made a, cl a clinging, clanking noise. He called them fiddlesticks. And he said, it's well, sort of like fiddlesticks or ta taken with it. But, uh, yeah. But in retrospect, looking back now, like you say, everything is sort of colored with memories like that. Sejak saat itu... Jeffrey kecil menjadi sibuk dengan hobi yang berbeda dengan kebiasaan anak-anak seusianya yang tertarik dengan tulang-tulang hewan. Pada tahun 1966, keluarga ini pindah ke Dolly's Town, Ohio. Dan di akhir tahun, pada bulan Desember, sang ibu melahirkan putra keduanya yang kemudian Jeffrey memberikan nama David untuk sang adik. Dan di tahun yang sama, Lionel memperoleh gelarnya dan mulai bekerja sebagai ahli kimia analitik di dekat Akron, Ohio. Pada tahun 1968, keluarga ini pindah lagi ke kota lain, ke Bird Township, Summit County, Ohio. Rumah ini berdiri di atas hutan seluas satu setengah hektar dan terdapat rumah kecil yang berdekatan dengan rumah utama. Di mana rumah atau gubuk kecil ini kemudian mulai digunakan Jeffrey untuk mengoleksi hewan-hewan kecil yang mati. Sang ayah yang semakin sangat sibuk di tempat kerjanya dan sang ibu seorang hipokondria yang penderita depresi ditambah dengan keretakan hubungan kedua orang tuanya yang sering bertengkar membuat Jeffrey jauh dari perhatian kedua orang tuanya. Ia merasa terisolasi. There is no evidence with Jeffrey Dahmer of any severe mistreatment or uh, abuse in his childhood. His mother had a mental problem. She was depressed most of the time. She slept a lot and dropped out of family activities. The father was a PhD a chemist and a very busy and very intelligent man who spent a great deal of his time uh, at work. Well, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of mental. Uh, my uh, former wife had a lot of uh, 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 mental and physical problems, and uh, we were so occupied with those problems that uh, it was difficult to concentrate on anything else. Or to see that your child was becoming increasingly lost. Increasingly shy, that's all that we saw. Jeffrey yang dikenali oleh guru SD-nya sebagai orang yang pemalu, tidak bergaul, dan memiliki sedikit teman. Kemudian semakin terobsesi dengan hobinya, mengoleksi hewan-hewan mati. Seperti serangga, capung, dan kerangka tupai. Beberapa sisanya, ia awetkan dalam toples yang ia simpan dalam kubuk kecilnya. Hobinya tersebut, ia terus lakukan hingga usia remaja. Ia kerap berjalan di sepanjang jalan untuk mencari hewan-hewan yang mati atau tertabrak, yang kemudian ia bawa pulang untuk menambah koleksinya. Apalagi ia tahu bagaimana teknik memutihkan dan mengawetkan tulang yang pernah didemonstrasikan sang ayah padanya saat usianya 10 tahun. He was a product of upper white middle class. He was educated. He came from um, a family of means. He uh, said that he found a roadkill and he wanted to see what was inside it, like a raccoon or a dog. He brought that home, a dead dog that he found on the side of the road was hit by a car, cut that open and looked at the insides of that. By that time he was already roaming the neighborhood streets on his bike and yes. collecting animal remains and yeah age 13 14 it's just inconceivable i and it's also how is he how is a child able to dismember animals and you know take the skin off their bones well, and i well, know you were a chemist and he had been around you and you know working with you at times but how was he able to do that without you or your wife or your mother anybody knowing that's what was going on well, we had a, about an acre and three-fourths of heavily wooded property, mm -hmm. and the adjacent properties were easy to hide, and Jeff was very good at hiding. This is your home there? Yes. When we talk about animal abuse, setting fires, these are results of childhood trauma, or lack of attachment, 
children can't express themselves, they can't tell you what's really bothering them, so they'll often set fires or hurt animals. That's their voice. This is a cry for help. Hidup sebagai remaja bagi Jeffrey sangat menyedihkan. Ia benar-benar merasa kesepian. Saat di rumah, Jeff semakin merasakan ketidakharmonisan orang tuanya. Dan di sekolah, menurut temannya seorang komikus yang juga membuat komik tentang Jeffrey Dahmer mengatakan bahwa ia di sekolah tidak bergaul. Ia kerap menjadi sasaran untuk dilecehkan oleh teman-teman sekolahnya. Bahkan sering dipukuli. Dahmer? Well, he was he had a pretty rough time here as did a lot of us. Uh, you know, he was a constant victim of harassment and abuse. <laughs> he was beat up a lot, especially early on. Later, you know, they sort of got bored with him, but uh, um, early on, I imagine he had it pretty tough. These are all things to consider. Was he you know, molested? No, he wasn't molested. Was he physically abused in the home? No, he was not physically abused. So Jeffrey had a, a difficult childhood. There was problems in the home between the husband and wife. He didn't have the attachment that most people have growing up, and he felt alone. Namun pada suatu hari saat usianya 13 tahun, ada seorang anak laki-laki di lingkungannya sempat berciuman dengan Jeffrey. Tapi itu pun tidak berlanjut. Namun itu membuat Jeffrey menyadari bahwa ia merasa tertarik pada laki-laki yang telah membangkitkan keirahnya. As he got to be about 13 or 14 and he was coming into his um, sexual awareness that uh, he uh, had uh, had some kissing with another boy in the neighborhood and he realized that he was attracted to boys becoming aroused sexually um, and the cutting up of these animals somehow became a match so what he did as a young man with animals he eventually did do later on in life with human beings uh, especially a male youngster uh, comes through his puberty and keeps everything in, bottles everything up inside himself uh, without uh, talking to peers or family or friends, anyone at all, about their fears and angers and frustrations. I feel very strongly that it's possible that, that there, uh, uh, all of those fears Our and signs anger can get mixed up yeah. with the sexual awakening such that they don't even understand what's going, what's going on. on. Dari semua hal yang ia alami dan ia rasakan di rumah, di sekolah dan tentang kebingungan akan ketertarikannya pada laki-laki serta rasa kesepiannya yang menyiksa. Lalu di usia 14 tahun, ia mulai mengenal minuman alkohol dan mulai mengkonsumsinya sebagai pelampiasan. Di tahun pertamanya ia di SMA River High School. Jeffrey dipandang sebagai orang buangan dan peminum. Ia bahkan minum sebelum pergi ke sekolah. Hingga sesampainya di sekolah, mulutnya tercium bau alkohol oleh teman sekelasnya. Jeffrey juga sering minum di sekolah yang ia sembunyikan di balik ceketnya. Menurut Jeffrey, mabuk adalah salah satu cara untuk menghilangkan rasa sakitnya dan kebingungan atas orientasi seksualnya dan fantasi yang jahat. When we got to high school, it was when suddenly he became this, this uh, incredible freak, uh, you know, with the drinking and uh, um, erratic behavior. 16, 17, 18 year range, which was completely hidden from me. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He was going to school, he was an alcoholic by the time he was 16. It appeared to be so. Mm -hmm. Going to school drunk every day, trying to cope with all of his fears of yeah. not being able to socialize and so forth never came home drunk picked up uh, liquor on the way at a friend's house mm -hmm. and this happened at school drinking at school apparently ia juga dikenal orang yang sangat sopan pendiam pemalu dan pemain tenis yang sangat baik remaja kesepian ini kemudian menjadi pusat perhatian di sekolahnya saat ia tak sengaja beradakan epilepsi yang ternyata banyak orang suka melihatnya dan tertawa hingga ia mulai banyak dikenali orang namun sebagai 
badut sekolahan yang menjadi objek taruhan teman-teman sekolahnya untuk berakting epilepsi di sekolah, di toko-toko dan pusat perbelanjaan yang mereka videokan dan kemudian teman-temannya mengumpulkan uang untuk dibayarkan pada Jeffrey atas keberhasilan aktingnya di mana uang tersebut ia gunakan untuk membeli minuman. Di masa pubertas, Jeffrey telah menyadari bahwa dirinya adalah seorang gay. Ia mulai membangun fantasi hasratnya yang tak biasa, yakni berhubungan intim dengan pria yang tidak sadarkan diri atau dengan mayat. Untuk sobat semua, sebelum lanjut ada baiknya untuk mengklik terlebih dahulu tombol like, share, dan subscribe serta tombol notifikasinya agar tak ketinggalan update kisah nyata tak biasa dari K Channel selanjutnya. Dengan pria yang tidak sadarkan diri atau dengan mayat. Dan fantasinya ia mulai rasakan nyata saat ia melihat surat kabar yang memberitakan seorang pemuda meninggal dan ia jatuh cinta pada pemuda itu ketika ia melihat fotonya hingga ia pergi ke rumah duka untuk melihat mayat yang ternyata itu telah membuat dia menjadi sangat terangsang. Dahmer told me that uh, on one occasion he had seen in the newspaper an account of a young man who was killed on a motorcycle and uh, he fell in love with the individual just from the photograph. Uh, he actually went to the funeral home to uh, view the, the corpse, but he became so aroused that he excused himself into the bathroom where he masturbated. To be with someone who had been buried. So in paraphilic terms, he had this sexual fantasy about being with someone who was unconscious. There's different kinds of paraphilia, right? There's the non-criminal paraphilia. 10% of American males are involved with different forms of paraphilia. Four of those 10 men are actually into criminal paraphilia. I mean, about half of those then get into the very, very violent types of criminal paraphilia. Free a lot of fantasies, didn't show those fantasies. Over time, fantasies become behavior. And these fantasies and the fantasies develop. There is a reason why he was more comfortable with dead people because he lacked the skill set to be intimate and such low self-esteem. He was so insecure in his own life that eventually he became more comfortable with, with people who then could not, who would not reject him. They were dead. Pada Mei 1978, saat usianya 18 tahun, Jeffrey lulus SMA. Namun kelulusannya ini tak membuatnya merasa bahagia disambut keluarga. Karena sang ibu pindah dari rumah dengan membawa adiknya, David, untuk tinggal bersama kerabat di Wisconsin. Sementara Jeffrey, ia tetap tinggal di rumahnya, di mana ia banyak tinggal sendiri di rumah. Of course, one day he comes home, I think when he was 17, his mother was gone. She took David, the son, the youngest son, and left. And uh, that really was, was traumatizing for him. Pada 18 Juni 1978, tiga minggu setelah kelulusannya, saat ia sedang mengendarai mobil sendirian, ia tak sengaja melihat seorang pemuda bertelanjang dada di pinggir jalan yang meminta tumpangan. Pemuda itu bernama Stephen Hicks. Jeffrey lalu memberikan tumpangan dan memujuknya untuk ke rumahnya dengan dalih untuk minum beberapa kaleng bir. Karena menurut Jeffrey, pemandangan Stephen dengan bertelanjang dada itu telah membagikan perasaan seksualnya. Setelah beberapa jam mereka berbicara sambil minum-minum dan mendengarkan musik, lalu Stephen pamit untuk pergi. Dan hal itu membuat Jeffrey kecewa dan berusaha menahannya dan memicunya melakukan hal yang jahat. He brought the guy home. They had access to alcohol. Uh, they were drinking. They got a little intoxicated. But when the guy wanted to leave, Jeff did not want him to leave. He wanted him to stay because he was lonely and also he was intoxicated. He said that uh, when he tried to stop the guy from leaving, a little bit of a wrestling match broke out. And as they were wrestling around, that's when Jeff grabbed the hand barbell and smashed the guy on the head. Now, he said when he hit him, he didn't really 
he wasn't thinking I'm going to kill this guy. I just want to keep him here. I knew that, that it was wrong, but uh, uh, after the, the first, the first uh, killing was not planned, I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over him. Jeffrey killed uh, Stephen Hicks. It was, I'm sure, a great relief for him. He finally got to act out his, his fantasies. He already knew how he was going to do it. I mean, he, he had planned out in fantasy first. And so he knew that this was the right time and moment to grab him, lure him in, and kill him. And now he gets to be with the body. And finally, that was his level of intimacy. He gets to be intimate with, with the body. Tim, I'm not going to laugh at him. I'm not going to make him feel insecure. He gets to do what he, what he wants to do. This is Dahmer's house. This is where he killed his, his uh, first victim. He took it into this crawl space and apparently stripped the flesh off the bones underneath there. And when the cops went in there, turned this light on and the whole thing lit up. Ceiling, floor, walls, everywhere. Just covered in dried blood. Mm -hmm. And there were so many areas that he could have done it in. And he timed it apparently when my uh, former wife and I weren't around. And that's where he killed his first victim there. Yes. Yeah. That you knew nothing about. I knew nothing about it. And he said for the next couple of weeks he'd read the paper every day to see was there anything about this guy missing or anything. Never did. So he realized I got away with murder. I killed somebody and nobody knows about it. I'm gay and nobody knows about it. Again, from the very beginning, more secrecy became part of his life. It also tortured him. And that's kind of how it started and then it just grew from there. Retakan hubungan kedua orang tuanya berakhir dengan perceraian yang telah diselesaikan pada 24 Juli 1978. Sang ibu mendapatkan hak asuh atas adiknya, David, dan pembayaran tunjangan. Sementara Jeffrey, kala itu ia mulai mempersiapkan masuk ke Ohio State University. Namun kebiasaannya yang banyak minum minuman keras ini telah membuat usahanya untuk menjalani kehidupan normal tidak berjalan sesuai rencana. Ia juga sempat menjadi tentara pada tahun 1979, namun kemudian dikeluarkan pada 24 Maret 1981. After he had flunked out of uh, uh, Ohio State for being drunk and then got kicked out of the army, uh, he had a short stint down in Florida. Uh, didn't last very long. Dan kini ia hidup sebagai peminum yang kesepian tanpa memiliki pekerjaan dan keterampilan lalu ayahnya membawa Jeffrey pergi ke Milwaukee, Wisconsin untuk tinggal dengan neneknya setelah Jeffrey ditahan 10 hari karena mabuk dan berperilaku tidak tertib di sini ia mulai berubah ingin menjadi orang yang lebih baik dengan lebih mendekatkan diri pada agama ia selalu berusaha pergi menemani neneknya ke gereja, membaca Alkitab, dan tidak melakukan hal-hal yang menentang ajaran agama sebagai cara untuk mengendalikan dorongan fantasinya. Yang terbukti, itu telah memberikannya ketenangan. He would go with Grandma to church on Sundays. He tried to read the Bible. He totally didn't do anything homosexual. He didn't try to get involved with any kind of gay stuff he said he really thought this is the way to go religion is going to be my savior Pada awal tahun 1982 Jeffrey mendapatkan pekerjaan sebagai plebotomis di Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center yang bertahan hanya 10 bulan Selama 2 tahun lebih ia menganggur ia hidup dari uang pemberian neneknya Pada Januari 1985 Jeffrey mendapatkan pekerjaan sebagai pencampur di pabrik coklat Milwaukee Ambrosia. Tak lama setelah ia bekerja di pabrik ini, suatu ketika saat ia sedang membaca buku di perpustakaan, ia tiba-tiba dilempari sebuah kertas kusut oleh seorang pemuda dengan isi tulisannya yang telah kembali membangkitkan fantasi lamanya yang telah ia kembangkan sejak remaja. 
An interesting thing uh, that tipped the, the balance for him was he was at the Wauwatosa Library. As he was sitting there reading a book, a young man walked by him and threw a crumpled up piece of paper in front of him and walked by. And Jeff took it, opened it up, and inside it said, if you want to blow Jeff, meet me in the men's room. Dari sanalah, ia mulai berpetualangan mengunjungi kafe dan bar gay, hingga ke tempat pemenian khusus gay. Pada akhir 1985, saat ia sering ke pemandian gay, namun ia merasa tidak mendapatkan kepuasan dan menjadi frustasi. Karena saat berhubungan intim, pasangan gaynya bergerak, tidak diam, seperti mayat sesuai fantasinya, atau setidaknya tidak sadarkan diri. Lalu akhirnya, ia mencampurkan obat penenang dalam minuman yang diberikan pada para pria yang ia temui di tempat pemandian. Untuk melakukan hubungan intim dengan keadaan, para pria itu tidak sadarkan diri karena telah tertidur oleh minuman campurannya. Setelah 12 kejadian seperti itu, Jeffrey ketahuan dan administrasi pemandian mencabut keanggotaannya. Pada tahun 1987, Jeffrey kembali berpetualang di Bar Gay. Ia kemudian bertemu seorang pria berusia 25 tahun bernama Stephen Tommy. Lalu Jeffrey membujuknya untuk menghabiskan waktu di Hotel Ambassador di kamar yang telah ia sewa. Jeffrey lalu kembali melakukan aksinya seperti yang ia biasa lakukan di tempat pemandian untuk membuat Stephen tak sadarkan diri. Namun ternyata hal sangat buruk terjadi. When I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars. And then I, one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the ambassador hotel, uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him. I had no intention of hurting him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I was heavily bruised. Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory I of it? Have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. He wanted to be the giver. He did not want to be the receiver of homosexual sex. Um, actually, uh, he enjoyed um, oral and um, anal sex. Uh, but did not want anyone to perform anal sex on him. He went to a uh, uh, department store across the street, and he bought a very large suitcase, or a small trunk, if you will, and uh, brought it up to the uh, room and put the body in it, and actually had the hotel uh, busboy help him bring the uh, body down to the street where he hailed a cab. The cab driver helped him load it into the uh, cab and, and said uh, to Dahmer, uh, this is really heavy, uh, buddy. What do you got in here, a body? And Dahmer said, yeah, I do. And la they both laughed about it. Setelah apa yang telah ia lakukan terhadap Stephen Tommy, Jeffrey mulai aktif mencari korban berikutnya yang kebanyakan ia temui di area hiburan gay. Selama dua bulan, ia puas menahan kepala Stephen Tommy yang kemudian menjadi tengkorak melalui proses pembersihan, perbusan, dan pemutihan sebelumnya untuk digunakan sebagai pemuas nafsunya. Lalu kemudian rapuh dan membuangnya. Lantas ia mulai mencari korban berikutnya. Kala itu ia bertemu dengan PSK gay yang berusia 14 tahun, James Dexter di mana Jeffrey menawarkan sejumlah uang padanya dengan modus untuk memotret di rumah neneknya di mana ia tinggal. Lalu kemudian Jeffrey melakukan hal jahat yang sama seperti pada korban sebelumnya. Pada 24 Maret 1988, Jeffrey bertemu seorang pria biseksual berusia 22 tahun bernama Richard Guerrero di luar sebuah bar gay The Phoenix. Dan kemudian Richard menjadi korban keempatnya. Pada bulan September 1988, neneknya meminta Jeffrey untuk pindah dari rumahnya. Karena kebiasaan minumnya, 
kebiasaan memasukkan pria larut malam dan bau busuk yang kadang-kadang sering tercium dari ruang bawah tanah dan kerasi. Lalu Jeffrey pun pindah ke apartemen di H. 08 North 24th Street pada 25 September. Namun dua hari setelah kepindahannya di tempat baru, ia ditangkap polisi karena telah memberikan minuman penenang dan mempelai secara hubungan dewasa pada lelaki berusia 13 tahun. Setelah sang korban berhasil kabur dan melaporkannya pada polisi, sang ayah kemudian menyewa pengacara Gerald Boyle untuk membela putranya yang dituduh telah membujuk korban untuk tujuan tidak bermoral. Dengan serangkaian evaluasi psikologis, Jeffrey dijatakan penderita gangguan kepribadian skizoid. Akhirnya hukuman Jeffrey ditangguhkan hingga dua bulan. Dan Jeffrey berjanji bahwa hal yang salah itu tidak akan terjadi lagi. Dua bulan setelah hukumannya, ia kembali tinggal di rumah neneknya dan kembali melakukan aksinya sebagai monster gay. Di mana saat itu ia bertemu dengan pria berusia 24 tahun. Anthony Sears di sebuah parke pada 25 Maret 1989 yang kemudian Anthony menjadi korbannya yang kelima dan kali ini Jeffrey mengawetkan kemaluan korban dan menyimpan kepalanya secara utuh yang kemudian ia simpan dalam kotak kayu terkunci bahkan ia kerap membawa kotak kayu itu ke tempat kerjanya yang ia taruh di lokernya When you were at his home, there was a time when you were at his home after he had moved to Milwaukee. I know we're skipping at a lot here. Home. At your mother's home. And you had gone to look in a box and he had said, don't open the box because there was, what, pornography in there? I had found some pornographic material prior to that and I thought there was pornographic material. By this time, you know your was. son's a little off, though, right? Well, uh, well, uh, I found, my mother had found the box. Mm -hmm. It was unopened. It was locked. Mm -hmm. And I asked Jeff to open it. I came to her house, asked her to open, asked him to open it. Thinking it was going to be pornography. Yeah, there. right. And he opened it, and what was there? He resisted opening uh -huh. it. Yeah. Okay. I insisted. He got mad. Uh, he tore up the birthday check that I gave him that same day. It was his birthday. Mm -hmm. How old was he? And he said he was um, um, in his twenties, okay. late twenties, okay. middle to late twenties. You Privacy. finally opened the box. I, d I didn't open the box. Frankly, Oprah, I don't know what I would have done if I would have opened the box, forcibly opened that box and seen what was in there. Because what was in there? A uh, human head. I kept the, uh, the mummified uh, head and skull of one of the victims in uh, a, a carrying case in my locker at work. Were you almost flaunting it? Yes, but that's how strong the compulsion was. That's how bizarre the, the desire was. I wanted to keep something of, of the person with me. Pada 14 Mei 1990, Jeffrey pindah dari rumah neneknya ke apartemen di 924 North Street di unit 213 sambil membawa kotak kayu yang berisi kepala tersebut ke tempat barunya. Dan di apartemen 213 inilah Jeffrey memenuhi semua fantasi kejinya yang kemudian menjadi tempat yang paling terkenal dan mengemparkan dunia. Karena di balik pintu 213 ini menyimpan serangkaian hal kejahatan yang paling mengerikan. Di mana Jeffrey telah membuat 12 pria menjadi korban di lokasi ini dan mengabadikannya dalam bentuk foto-foto dengan menggunakan kamera Polaroid yang sengaja ia beli dengan tujuan agar ia bisa mengingat keindahan fisik dari semua korbannya. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance, their physical beauty. Uh, I also wanted to keep something if I couldn't keep them there with me whole. When you killed these men afterwards, were you repulsed? Were you upset? No, it at the time uh, it was it was almost addictive. It was almost uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. <laughs> 
So here's the building where it used to be, and now the city has done nothing with this. Absolutely nothing. It just sits there fallow. Now, the building was in this design. It was a rectangle, three-story, white stucco, 36-unit apartment. Before you went out to pick up the man, was there any kind of ritual you went through? I'd go to the nightclubs, uh, drink, watch the, uh, the strip tea shows. And uh, if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd uh, go to the bath clubs and uh, meet, meet someone there offer them money and we'd go back to the apartment um, have a few drinks I'd have the uh, the uh, sleeping pill mixture already prepared person would drink it fall asleep and uh, that's when they would be strangled did you like feeling evil no no I didn't but uh, I had tried to overcome the thoughts and it worked for a while but eventually I gave in Jeffrey kembali melanjutkan aksinya itu satu minggu setelah ia tinggal di apartemen barunya ini dan di tempat ini pula fantasinya berkembang semakin liar di mana tindakan kecilnya itu menjadi semakin meningkat ia bereksperimen mencari sensasi untuk memenuhi kepuasan fantasinya dengan cara-cara yang sangat tidak lazim. Seperti menjelajah semua organ tubuh korban. Salah satunya bercinta dengan jeruan dalam tubuh korban yang telah ia belah. He would come back from work and make love with the dead body. He would sleep with it. He would lie with it. He would rub it and have sex with it. He was just very very enamored with the uh, concept of opening a, a body seeing the internal organs go forth and uh, several of the bodies he would put in his bathtub and pack with ice in midweek because he had to work the next day so he could keep them for the weekend where he'd have more time to enjoy himself with these bodies uh, he said to do that he'd have to shower with cold water so he wouldn't melt the ice <laughs> it was uncomfortable it was well worth it he had to do more and more things in order to have this satisfying orgasm it just started with having pornographic homosexual um sex and then ha actually having homosexual sex with people in the baths and then having sex and killing and then having sex with dead people and then having sex with the viscera and then actually eating the people that he had sex with to get this this superb orgasmic experience dan ternyata ia meningkatkan lagi fantasinya dengan pemakan daging-dagingnya kadang menurutnya dengan begitu mereka telah menjadi bagian dari dirinya some cases as in the case of Jeffrey Dahmer there was a sexual component to it now there is the blood part where he sampled the blood so blood itself is a type of paraphilia there it was very easy to then taste the flesh it was something that they explored and so when he realized it didn't taste bad then he kept advancing in that and doing more of that so jeffrey ate penises i mean he, he ate internal organs and he was their bodies and, and he had some favorite victims people he he preferred Physically, they were becoming part of him. He drank their blood, they were part of him, and now he eats their flesh. It was all part of this, I need to feel powerful. I need to feel I'm normal. What he did was he bought an adaptable grill to put on his gas stove. We found this, and he said he would just kind of sear it on both sides with a little oil. Um, keep. He did add some condiments to it, some vegetables and mushrooms and onions and towards the end there that was the, the month before we caught him pretty much the only meat that he ate was was human it was uh, branching out that's when the cannibalism started eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle it was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me at, at, for, at first it was just curiosity and then it became compulsive. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state. Um, by uh, 
injecting um, first uh, dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water and uh, it never did completely work. Seiring dengan tumpukan mayat yang berada di apartemennya, bau yang menyengat menjadi masalah besar bagi Jeff. Karena mulai tercium oleh para penghuni sekitarnya, hingga pihak pengelola apartemen harus menangani banyak keluhan tanpa mencari tahu atau menyelidiki sumber bau tersebut. Jeff said that this was a continual problem, the smell that his neighbors, the building supervisor um, complained about the smell. When the bodies were still in your apartment, there was no time when you would see them and say, this is grotesque, what have I done? There were times, there were times, but the compulsive obsession with uh, doing what I was doing overpowered any feelings of revulsion. Dalam menemukan korbannya, Jeff tidak selalu mencari para pria gay, walau sebagian besar adalah para homo. Tetapi ia juga melihat adanya kesempatan, seperti yang terjadi pada pria 17 tahun bernama Curtis Sawyer, di mana Jeff bertemu dengan jadi hal debis. Right up here is a young man um, from uh, Upper Michigan who is just down here visiting. And Jeff Dahmer met him in the bus stop right over there in front of that McDonald's and convinced him to come home with him. That was the end of that guy. Dalam melakukan aksinya itu, tidak selamanya berjalan mulus. Jeff sempat mendapatkan sedikit masalah saat ia membiarkan seorang remaja Laos berusia 14 tahun, Konerek Sinta Somfot, di apartemennya sendiri. Dalam keadaan pingsan dan terluka, karena efek dari pil tidur dan suntikan asam klorida yang dilakukan Jeff. Pada dini hari tanggal 27 Mei 1991, Jeff kembali ke apartemen Jah dari Bargay untuk minum beberapa gelas bir. Kemudian ia menemukan Konerak duduk tak berpakaian di sudut jalan, sedang berbicara menggunakan bahasa Laos sambil terbata-bata dengan tiga wanita yang berdiri di dekatnya. Jeff kemudian menjelaskan bahwa Konerek adalah pacarnya berusia 19 tahun dan dia sedang mabuk. Namun tiga wanita ini tak lantas percaya. Mereka menghubungi 911 agar polisi dapat mencari tahu kejelasannya. Karena tiga wanita ini merasa curiga melihat ada beberapa luka di tubuh Konerek. Saat polisi dan petugas pemadam kebakaran datang dan meminta Jeff untuk membuktikan bahwa Konerek adalah kekasihnya, mereka masuk ke apartemen Jeff dan Jeff menunjukkan dua foto konerek tanpa berbusana. Lantas polisi pun percaya dan memasrahkan Jeff untuk merawat konerek di apartemennya. Walaupun para polisi sempat mengomentari bau busuk di dalam apartemen Jeff saat itu, tetapi polisi tidak menyelidiki bau tersebut. Jeff kembali lolos dan ia terus melakukan aksinya. Namun pada tanggal 22 Juli 1991, menjadi hari terakhir baginya. Saat Edwards, pria berusia 32 tahun, berhasil kabur dari apartemen Jeff setelah Edwards mencium hal aneh dari Jeff. Ketika sesi pemotretan tanpa busara itu diawali dengan Jeff memborgol pergelangan tangannya, lalu mengacukan pisau ke arah jantungnya. Dengan kata lain, Jeff akan memakan jantungnya. Was listening to my heart because at a point he told me he was gonna eat my heart at that point. I hit him and I ran. Setelah lima jam bersama, Edwards mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meninju wajah Jeff. Lantas ia melarikan diri dan meminta pertolongan petugas polisi yang sedang berpatroli di jalan raya untuk membuka borgolnya. Rupanya kunci borgol polisi tidak sesuai dengan borgol di tangan Edwards. Akhirnya mereka pergi ke apartemen Jeff. Jeff opened the door. They they said who they were and what they wanted, but Jeff didn't have the key for the handcuff because he didn't the way he got the handcuffs back from his victims was by cutting off their hand. It was uh, the night of the arrest. They have no memory of what happened uh, during the six hours before uh, the last victim ran out of the apartment. I heard a knock on the door and the police were there. 
with with the last victim. Uh, they asked me where the key was to the handcuffs. I was my mind was in a haze. I sort of pointed to the bedroom, and that's where they uh, found the pictures. And they they yelled, "Cuff him!" I was uh, handcuffed, and uh, it it was just the realization that there was no point in trying to hide hide uh, my actions anymore. The the best route was to help help the police identify all the victims and just uh, make a complete confession. Um, I saw Dahmer was arrested on the ground, handcuffed, and I was told by the officers to look um, in the refrigerator. At this time, when I did open up the refrigerator, what I found in there was an empty refrigerator with a cardboard box containing a freshly severed head of a black male. The eyes and the mouth were open. I felt fear from the bottom of my feet all the way to the top of my head. You, you, you can't make sense of anything that looks so bizarre. He didn't tell us about eating people right away. In the freezer part of the refrigerator, they found individually wrapped and prepared body parts. The thigh, bicep, heart, liver. We had body parts cooking on the stove. I mean, he had all kinds of, he had, had them body parts in drawers. And then you can imagine the stench going to that apartment. You can imagine the two police officers who walked into that apartment and realized that Jeffrey was standing behind them. And they were looking at these body parts. I would love to, it was over. I mean, he could have killed them, but he wasn't. He had, he knew the end was coming. When the police arrived, he knew he was going to just give it up. There was no struggle from him at all. Yeah, I, you got me. What did he say to you after the arrest? Right after the arrest, the first time I saw him, mm -hmm. he hung his head and was looked very disheveled. And he said, I'm so sorry, Dad. I don't know what to say. There's nothing I can say. I did it again. So, in other words, he was. it was just another, I'm sorry. She said, my son never tried to hurt anybody. He killed them, but he never tried to hurt them, which was absolutely true. Every necrophile I've ever interviewed or researched, none of them ever try to hurt the victims. They just kill them. I'd say 95% of them are not sadistic because they want the corpse to be with the corpse. I, I interviewed... So Jeffrey Dahmer never intended to hurt his victims, ever. There's no sadism. What he wanted was to be with somebody, and so killing them was the process of getting to be with somebody. He's definitely not a psychopath. Not even, not even close, because sociopath. And the difference, there's quite a big distinction, and I train law enforcement to understand these distinctions. A true psychopath is someone usually who's very sadistic. They have no empathy. They, they manipulate, they control people. And certainly we see some of that with sociopaths. But sociopaths are, are very emotional. They still love their moms. They still have emotional attachments dark spot in him which grew and grew and grew and that's where he lived his life was in this dark dark zone on a personal note I, mean, I I call that evil I think Jeffrey became a very evil person was he a bad person it's complex Biro Investigasi Kriminal Polisi Milwaukee mengungkapkan penemuan mengejutkan di apartemen Jeffrey Dahmer dari para korban di antaranya Terdapat empat kepala berada di dapur. Tujuh tengkorak yang sebagian dicat dan sebagian diputihkan. Yang ditemukan di kamar tidur dan di dalam lemari. Tetesan darah dalam nampan di bagian bawah kulkas. Dua hati, otot lengan yang dibungkus plastik di rak. Seluruh batang tubuh, sekantong organ dan daging yang menempel di es bagian bawah. Sepasang tangan dan dua kemaluan yang diawetkan. Kulit kepala dalam drum galon. Tiga batang tubuh yang telah terpotong-potong yang dilarutkan dalam larutan asap. Dan 74 foto mengerikan dari kamera Polaroid. Kasus Jeffrey Dabar telah berdampak rasisme sistemik di Milwaukee. Karena sebagian besar dari korbannya adalah orang berkulit hitam. Gelombang protes terus bermunculan. Mereka menganggap lembaga kepolisian kurang ketat dan tidak cekatan dalam menerima keluhan-keluhan lama dan laporan saksi. Hingga polisi gagal 
dalam mengejar Jeffrey Dahmer secara agresif karena banyak korban berkulit hitam yang diyakini telah ditargetkan oleh Jeffrey. Namun semua itu tidak dibenarkan oleh Jeffrey Dahmer menurut pengakuannya. N of your 17 victims were black. Were they racially motivated? It, it was not racially motivated. It was not a sexual preference. It was just to find an obsession with uh, the best looking young man I could find. They chose men of color because he wasn't a man of color. And that way he wouldn't be a suspect. Because if, if these men of color were being disappearing, they'd be looking for someone else of a man of color who might be doing it. And he certainly didn't fit that description. Begitupun bagi komunitas LGBT yang merasa kasus ini telah menghancurkan mereka. The community was shattered. You know, I mean, people stopped coming out. I blew my life apart. It didn't just affect my life. Jeffrey Dahmer didampingi oleh pengacara lamanya, Gerald Boyle, untuk membelanya di persidangan. All right. Edward Warren Smith tried to be Jeffrey Dahmer's friend. As a result, he lost his life. You took his life like a thief in the night by cutting his throat. Did you ever stop to think that this was someone's son? I would like to say to Jeffrey Dahmer that he don't know the pain, the hurt, the loss, and the mental state that he had put our family in. Tell me just what is it that I've done to you to make you such a monster, to make you such a maniac, to make you such a devil. My God, who are you? What are you? You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I hope you, I hope you can deal with what you've done. So Jeffrey, when you killed my brother, Richard Guerrero, you also killed my father and my mother's youngest future. And my three brothers' lives, including my life, My husband and my three children will never forget this tragedy. It's the devil, the pure devil that walked our street. So, Your Honor, please, I beg you, don't let this man ever walk our streets or see daylight again. Thank you. Jeffrey Dahmer, about the pain that you caused my family. That was my baby boy that you took away from me. This man should never be able to walk the face of earth or to be able to harm anyone else again. My mother gave five beautiful kids. We lost. He destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. And I just wanted to know, you know, just why. You know, why would it be my son, you know? <laughs> And just keep this man off the street, please. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, mother. I hate you. Step out of control. Don't me, Jeffrey. I kill you, God damn it! I can't take this motherfucker. I can kill you. I can kill you. You don't have to do it. Dan pada 17 Februari 1992. Pengadilan memutuskan Jeffrey Dahmer bersalah dan dijatuhi hukuman penjara seumur hidup. Jeffrey dimasukkan ke penjara Columbia Correctional Institution, Portage, Wisconsin, dengan standar keamanan maksimum. Saat berada di penjara, ia kembali hidup secara religius dan mulai berhubungan dengan seorang pendeta yang selalu mengunjunginya di penjara untuk membimbingnya dan membaca Alkitab setelah pembaptisannya. Uh, the only uh, emotion he ever had confessed to regarding his murders was was love. It wasn't hatred at all. And I don't. I never saw a sense of malice or anger or hatred toward any of his victims at all. If you were out on the street now, would you still be committing the crimes? Probably. If this hadn't happened, there's no doubt I probably would be. I can't think of anything that would have stopped me. Do you know what started it? Was there any kind of incident that you can remember? To this day, I don't know what started it. And uh, the 
person to blame is sitting right across from you. That's the only person. Not uh, parents, not society, not pornography. I mean, those are just excuses. Pada 28 November 1994, dua narapidana di lembaga permasyarakatan tersebut ditemukan terbunuh oleh narapidana bernama Christopher Scover. Dan salah satu korbannya adalah Jeffrey Dahmer. Dalam hasil investigasi dikatakan dalam penyerangan tersebut, Jeffrey Dahmer tidak melakukan perlawanan sama sekali. Seolah Jeff telah pasrah dan dikatakan pula bahwa Jeff telah merasa bahwa hidupnya sudah tidak ada gunanya lagi. But Jeff Dahmer had no defense of marks on him that all his strikes were from the beginning, from the head. And a very interesting thing what I thought was interesting was he was killed with a hand barbell which is the same instrument he used to kill his very first victim. Actually, she told me that if he finally said to her on a phone call, he said, I, I don't want to be in prison anymore, but I also know I'm too dangerous to be on the streets. Because he knew if he was back on the streets, he'd probably do it again. And what, maybe three weeks later, he was dead. And I, I think that when he was attacked, it was probably a relief for him. Dahmer was a big guy. He could handle himself. The man who attacked him actually killed Dahmer and another man at the same time. He had, I think he had a lead pipe. Dahmer could have fought back, but he didn't. I'm sure he did not fight back. He wanted to die, and this was his way out. I think had he not been killed, that he would have eventually taken his own life. Absolutely, he would have killed himself. As he said in his own words, my life was pathetic. I think he wanted to end that pathetic life, recognizing all the harm he had done to his family, to the community, to, to, our, to our nation. I mean, I, it was just so overwhelming for him. I think that he just knew that what's the point of being alive? Uh, I, I think he got impacted. Could someone like you be stopped? Could you be helped? No, I, I was I was dead set on, on going with this compulsion. It was the only thing that gave me any uh, any satisfaction. Jeffrey Dahmer was cremated immediately, although his brain was removed at the request of his mother. She wanted the brain studied because she's trying to offset the uh, belief that Lionel had suggested that somehow his brain was deformed. About a year later, the scientist involved with the brain decides there's no abnormality with his brain. Pada tahun 1994, tahun kematian Jeffrey Dahmer, ayahnya Lionel Dahmer menulis buku berjudul A Father's Story yang berfokus pada masa kecil putranya, Jeffrey Dahmer. Lionel juga menyalahkan dirinya sendiri dalam bukunya atas kelalaiannya terhadap Jeffrey secara emosional. I mean, there was, you know, I would I would encourage any parent though who has problems and there are millions of people who have a divorce, who have marital problems. Elicit, draw out information in all kinds of ways with your minister with your rabbi with with because uh, now you can see whoever. where the trouble was was yeah. breeding itself the psychologist that i have seen to help me through this uh said he didn't even know if he could ever draw out anything to elicit anything to show these bizarre thoughts that were developing jeff's mind But it's worth a trial. It's worth a checkup for any parents. Take their kids. If they're extremely shy, it doesn't mean that they have to go to a psychologist. But go for a checkup if they're not talking to anyone at all about their fears and anger. So, Dan berikut sejumlah referensi dari kisah nyata K Channel kali ini. Bagaimana menurut Sobat K semua? Silahkan berbagi pendapatnya yang tentunya dengan sikap bijak dalam menerima berita dari berbagai media baik dari luar negeri maupun dalam negeri ke kolom komentar. Dan jangan lewatkan berita lainnya yang berbeda selanjutnya di K-Channel.